Okay, uh, this is the eighth class meeting of EC574, the graduate level probability and random processes. Uh, we've taken quiz one, and uh, it was also assigned as homework number six. And I hope you examine the solutions I posted to PRMS carefully and uh, learned a lot. And if you haven't learned a lot, uh, you, uh, I recommend you do it again. Okay. Uh, problems uh, four to the end of uh, original homework six is now assigned as homework seven because uh, some of you felt uh, you didn't have enough time. So it's still on this Thursday. So you have two more minutes, two more uh, days. Uh, handouts are updated, so uh, you go to the uh, our primary course homepage and download the handout. Passwords are as usual. It's usually related to the, uh, if it is a handout related to chapter some number, then type that number in a lower case. Video lectures are also available, and I hope uh, no uh, voice outage happens again. So this is the overview of uh, this course. Uh, we started to cover chapter nine of the populist textbook, but uh, we followed the uh, people's chapter seven. Uh, in the first section, uh, we learned what is a random process. And then uh, we studied a little bit of the stationarity and independence of random processes. And then uh, we studied the Gaussian random process. Here, uh, the Gaussian random processes were all real valued. And then uh, we started to study uh, the Poisson random processes. We are going to finish it today and move to complex random processes because uh, from quiz one, uh, I've found that you are not well equipped with uh, complex valued random variables, vectors, and processes. Got it? And then uh, we will go back to uh, section two, uh, time average and ergodicity. And then uh, we cover correlation functions and measurement of correlation functions, which some of you may have a huge interest in. And then uh, we will cover chapter seven of Populis entitled Sequences of Random Variables. This is the key difference uh, from the undergraduate course. So we are going to uh, think more about the major theoretic uh, definitions of the convergence of random variables. Anyway, let me quickly review what we learned last time about uh, Poisson process. Before we define uh, the Poisson process, we started to uh, learn about some uh, real world situations where you can define first a counting process, and then you can define an associated arrival process, and also you can define an associated inter-arrival process. Got it? And, and I believe now you are familiar with those concepts. Okay. Given the single uh, uh, real world phenomena, you can define a continuous time or discrete time counting process, and you can define a discrete time, or you may say the uh, sequence of random variables called the uh, arrival process, and another discrete time random process called inter-arrival process. Of course, uh, they have different names, uh, meaning the same thing. So uh, arrival process is also called count time process or point process. And the inter-arrival process has alias inter-count time process. And if the inter-arrival process uh, has a random variable, has random variables, uh, with independent and identically distributed, then it is called linear process. And uh, we will see that the Poisson process is has a, a, a has the interarrival process, which is a linear process. But sometimes we just say this counting process is linear process. 
even though precisely speaking, if we say renewal, then it should be uh, related to the interarrival process, but almost everybody just says uh, the Poisson process as a counting process is a renewal process. And after we uh, studied these three random processes, given a single real world phenomena, uh, then we went back to uh, the counting process and defined the notion of increment. What was the increment? Given, for example, a continuous time counting process, and if you uh, fix some interval like this, usually our convention is to exclude the left hand and include the right hand, and then uh, n of t final minus n of t initial is called the increment given this interval. Got it? And some random processes have a very interesting uh, increment. First, if you choose non-overlapping multiple intervals, then associated, these are, by the way, random variables, right? Uh, these increments as random variables are independent. In that case, we say that the random process has independent increments. And another one is that, uh, given this situation, this increment, this increment as a random variable has the uh, CDF or PDF or PMF or characteristic function only parameterized by time difference. Then we say that the increment is stationary property. So uh, the stationary random process, that term is not related to the stationary increment. Got it? So when we classify a random process, there is a term called stationarity. However, in this case, we are concerned with an increment. And then we say increment is stationary. If the uh, distribution is parameterized by time difference only. And there are interesting class of random processes, continuous time or discrete time, counting or non-counting processes that this increment satisfies both of the properties, independence and stationarity. And then we call the random process is a Rebi process. So if I draw a Venn diagram, here goes, for example, the set of all continuous time or discrete time random processes, then there is a very small, very small subset. But let me exaggerate the size. And this is the subset of all uh, Levy processes. It could be continuous time or discrete time. And of course, uh, I didn't say that the Levy process is defined given a counting process. Counting process could be a Levy process and a non-counting process could be Levy process. So here is the set of, the subset of all counting processes. And then we have a good news here. The Poisson process we are going to learn is in the intersection. So it's a counting process and it's a Rebi process, got it? So as I summarize here, uh, a Poisson process is a continuous time Rebi process, and also it's a counting process, and it's a linear process with memoryless distribution, which means uh, the random process X of N, let me say uh, counting process N of T, uh, arrival processes x sub n, so uh, sorry, s sub n. 
and uh, let me denote the interarrival process as x sub n. Then here, uh, linear process means that x ends are uh, iid. And here, uh, Poisson random process is a linear memorized process means that x ends are uh, iid and exponential. By the way, a continuous random variable is memoryless means that its conditional uh, distribution is same as the uh, marginal distribution, but especially uh, this is uh, just a second. This is yes, probability of x. X is memoryless. Probability of X less than, let me say, X plus T given X. Let me say greater than. something like this, okay. So suppose X means arrival of some person and you have waited for time T. The people hasn't yet arrived. Now you want to know the probability, conditional probability that the person arrives X minutes later or great, uh, uh, great uh, uh, x minutes or greater. And then it's same as this, got it? So you are having been waiting for t seconds or t minutes does not mean that uh, the person will come soon, got it? Anyway, uh, given this memoryless uh, this definition, the only uh, continuous random variable that satisfies this property is exponential. That's what is known, got it? Okay, preview. So we are going to see the definitions. So definitions, there are many, many definitions. Definitions of a Poisson process. And we are going to find the nth order probability mass functions uh, given the definition because Many definitions do not define a Poisson process by using the nth order probability mass functions. They define it in some strange way, but those are definitions, which means that we must be able to find all nth order probability mass functions of the random process, because that is the definition of the full characterization of a random process. Got it? And then uh, we are going to calculate the mean function and the autocorrelation function of a Poisson process. And probably after that, I will ask you whether a Poisson process is a wise and stationary random process or not, because we have calculated uh, the mean and autocorrelation function. So let it. And then we are going to move to uh, the world of complex valued random something. First, variables, and then vectors, and then processes. Got it? And I will especially emphasize uh, complex valued Gaussian random variables, vectors, and processes, because they appear again and again and again and again, especially in uh, digital communications. OK, so here goes the definition one uh, from the, I believe, from one of the, is it from our uh, people's book? I, I don't know, I do not remember. Anyway, here goes the first one. So definition one says that a continuous time random process is a Poisson process if these three conditions are met. First, at time zero, 
it is zero. And two, it has independent increments. As I told you, so far, this definition hasn't yet said N of T is a counting process. It just says it's a continuous time process. And given any continuous time process, you can define the notion of increment, right? You, you choose an interval and you can find the increment associated with the interval. And increments are independent. What does that mean? Here, we assume that these increments are non-overlapping. So given a time axis, if you choose intervals which do not overlap, then we have an increment here, an increment here, and another increment here. So we have three random variables, and they are independent. Okay, so we now know the meaning of these independent increments. And the third one is that the increments are stationary. So uh, the second and third condition says that it's a Rebi process. However, uh, so far, we do not know what is the distribution of this random variable. And it says that the increment during a period of length t2 minus t1 is a Poisson random variable. And you know that a Poisson random variable is a discrete random variable, taking the value from 0, 1, 2, da, 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 right? So it could be a natural number or 0. And here, as you remember, Poisson random variable is parameterized by a single parameter. And that parameter is lambda times some constant times this length of the interval. So uh, as I told you, uh, stationarity of an increment means what? The distribution must be parameterized only by, of course, excluding lambda, uh, only by the difference of T2 and T1. Okay. So not T1, not T2 alone through T2 minus T1. Okay. And here, Lambda is called the arrival rate. By the way, if you remember uh, the definition of the probability mass function of a Poisson random variable, uh, let's say n, then uh, what is the probability that uh, n equals some number k? Here n is Poisson. And as you see a hint here, k factorial in the denominator. And numerator, you have what? You have uh, some parameter raised to the power k. And what? And you have e to the negative something, right? So these two are the same. Got it? And here, let me ask you a question. We model a real world problem. We are a real world random experiment using, for example, a Poisson random variable. Then what would be the unit of the quantity appearing in the exponent of this exponential function? And this is what I want you to remember from now on until you finish your life as an engineer, okay? The exponent must be unitless, okay? No unit. Okay. If you have some parameter that has unit in seconds, meters, you are wrong, okay? Definitely you are incorrect. So here, this must be a unitless quantity. And here the same. 
And we go back to here, the increment during this means what? N of T2 minus N of T1. And this equals K. And this event has probability. What? Poisson random variables probability to have K. And so you have something raised to the power of K. And e to the negative, this something. And now, this something must be a function of t2 minus t1. And the simplest function would be a linear function, right? Means this something is a constant times t2 minus t1. And fortunately, it is. Got it? Fortunately, in Poisson random process, this something is a constant times the length of the interval. And now, this is in what? In second. What does that mean? Lambda must have the unit. 1 over second means hertz or per second. Got it? As I emphasized again and again. By the way, uh, you may not understand what I mean, if, but consider the McLaurin series or Taylor series at x equals 0. Then what? You know that this is 1 plus x plus x squared x cubed, something like that, right? And suppose x has some unit. What does that mean? Unit, unit squared, unit cubed, unit raised to the power of million. Can they be added? No, right? The, the, uh, the dilemma or how to say that the paradox, uh, which, uh, tortured me when I was the first year elementary school student was this. So I said, one plus one is two. And my friend says that, okay, here is one cup of water and another cup of water. And here is a big cup and you have one cup. One plus one is one. What is wrong with that argument? At that time, since I was so young, I had no idea, but whenever you add something, these two quantities in the real world. So you, you model uh, the real world using mathematics, right? You must have the same unit, right? And he was wrong in using different size of cup, right? For example, 200, uh, 200 milliliter cup fully filled and 200 milliliter cup fully filled with water. And then if I add, I must have two 200 milliliter cups, right? Same thing. So here, they cannot be added if they have, uh, if excess unit, got it? Anyway, so uh, be careful. So lambda is some rate because it's, it has unit per second, right? Given a unit time, something happens. That is the meaning of lambda, got it? So this third one means that, uh, what, what, what? We have lambda T2 minus T1, and here negative lambda T2 minus T1, got it? <coughs> yeah. Be careful. Yeah. And K can be uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. And for this, we have to define this uh, 0 factorial equals 1 and uh, something like that. By the way, uh, given a Poisson random variable, what is the mean and the variance? And probably you remember. 
So suppose a Poisson random variable is parameterized, parameterized by something. And in order not to confuse you, let me say this is alpha, okay? So in this case, alpha is lambda times the uh, t2 minus t1. And then what is the expected value of n and what is the variance of n? Anybody? Anybody remembers? As you remember, uh, these are alphas. Okay. Is it alpha square? Uh, alpha square. By the way, uh, no, no, is it alpha square or alpha? I do not remember. Yeah, it is alpha. <coughs> yeah. Anyway, something like that. Okay. Anyway, so the first definition of a Poisson random process is very simple. Three conditions in terms of increments. Okay. So as I told you, Given a counting process, actually we are going to handle counting process, uh, the Poisson process as counting process. But anyway, uh, a counting process can be described as what? First counting process and second arrival process and uh, third inter-arrival process. But if the counting process is a continuous time and the discrete time, uh, since, since arrival process is also a continuous time or discrete time process, you can define increments and then you can say blah, blah, blah. Here, first definition is in terms of the increment. And if these three conditions really define or fully characterize this random process called a Poisson random process, then what? We must be able to derive every nth order probability mass function, right? That is the Kolmogorov's definition of a random process. We must be either find that strange mapping rule or we must be able to find every nth order probability mass functions or Got it? Since this random process takes only values in the non-negative integer, when we sample this random process, we have what? Discrete random variables. So as we know, discrete random variables can be fully characterized by joint probability mass functions. We don't need density functions involving direct deltas. So this is the first order PMF, right? At time T1, oh, sorry, at time T1, K1, and at time T1 and T2, K1 and K2, blah, 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 blah. So how can we find? This part is the easiest one if we use the tree like this. So we subtract N of zero because it doesn't affect, it's zero, right? And then suddenly you notice that this is an increment, right? This is an increment. This is a random variable. Associated with this interval, zero T1. And the third condition says that what? This random variable is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda times, in this case, T1. That's why we have the first probability mass function here. Got it? So we have found the first order probability mass function. Done. And then we want to find the second order or uh, second order joint probability mass functions. This one. How can we find? And it's at the first glance, it's difficult. It was difficult when I was uh, a sophomore, okay? This example is from the uh, people's textbook. And as I once told you, there were three classes 
parallel classes in the semester because uh, I had uh, around 200 uh, class, not, not how to say, it, the students in my department taking the uh, uh, third year courses. Uh, I was at the time uh, just back from the military service and taking uh, one of the three classes and the professor was very fast in covering the entire textbook of papers. And I, I, I still remember the day. What? <laughs> How can I find this? <laughs> and the trick is, uh, again, uh, very simple, actually. Instead of finding the joint density immediately, we use what? The definition of conditional probability. So here the approach is this one. Instead of directly finding this, we consider this conditional probability. Assuming here, without loss of generality, T2 is greater than T1. Anyway, we are going to choose two time instants. And if they are the same, we go back to this one. And probably you, we use a uh, uh, Kronecker delta. So we can say that, OK, T1 and T2 are different. And one of them must be bigger than the other. And let's say T2 is bigger. Now, given n over T1 is k1, some integer, 0 or something, we want to find this probability. And we know that this number k2 must be greater than or equal to k1. Because what? Because? Because what? Still, we need a trick. This number is what? Can be written in terms of two non-overlapping increments. OK, got it? So this is a trick. Because the, our first definition is in terms only of the increment. We have to approach any problem using increments. Okay? If it does not work, take, take other paths. So this increment and that increment, both are what? Poisson random variables, and they are added. How could, be, could it be negative or, or less than this one? This is K1, right? You add some uh, non-negative number. Oh, sorry, greater than or zero. Got it? And now your condition also be written as this one. So what does that mean? You have three random variables. One, this random variable is K1. Now you want to find the probability of event that this random variable plus that one is K2. What does that mean? This is K2 minus K1, right? So here we have an intermediate step says, okay, T2 minus NT1 equals K2 minus K1 given N of T1 is K1, right? Right? Because this event conditioned on that event is the same as this event, right? So whenever you confront conditional probabilities, you have to replace the event with an equivalent event. Otherwise, you have to have some inequalities. Now, we use the independent increment property because this is also an increment, right? Still, we can subtract n0, then the interval in the conditioning bar on the right side of the conditioning bar is non-overlapping with the interval on the left side of the conditioning bar. So they are independent means what? You can drop the condition. So n of t2 minus n of t1 equals k2 minus k1 and done, right? And now you know that this random variable is Poisson with parameter lambda times this interval. 
And then you want to find the probability that that random variable has value k2 minus k1. So this is the, your answer, right? Here, the only difference is that lambda t1 is replaced by lambda times t2 minus. And then what? Our objective was this one, right? So we multiply the first order PMF, then as you know that it becomes the second order PMF. So you multiply these two to obtain that one. If you do not follow me right now, you have a serious problem in the understanding of the conditional uh, probability mass. So we multiply these two, right? As you see, this is the conditional probability you've just calculated, and that is the marginal probability mass. And after simple manipulation, we have got this second order PMF, got it? And what about third order? What about fourth order? We do the same thing. So let's try the third order. And then everything is just very simple. So now we have three time instance. And I want to find this joint probability mass function. T3, K3, T2, K2, T1, K1. And what do you want to do? You want to recycle, right? You want to recycle uh, what you already have. So we convert that to a product of the conditional probability and unconditional probability. So what kind of? Anybody? Yeah, we may uh, assume that without loss of generality, T3 less than, uh, sorry, greater than T2, greater than T1. And then we may want to condition on the last one. Or we may condition on the last two. So for example, no, 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 I don't do that. I would do this. Something like this. And then this is already done, right? And probably we can convert this part and after some manipulation, we may use that one, got it? So we are done. Similarly, we could proceed to any nth order. Of course, uh, formally, we need mathematical induction, but uh, I will not uh, talk about that. Okay, here goes the second definition. Second definition is in terms of the inter-arrival time process inter-arrival process of the uh, counting process. So this definition says that a continuous time counting process is Poisson if its associated inter-arrival process is a linear process with exponential random distribution. Okay, very simple. So here you start from zero and some first arrival, second arrival, third arrival, and this is x1, and this is x2, and this is x3, and blah, 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 got it? And here, x ends uh, iid with exponential. And here, uh, used xi, so let me use xi. And density function of xi is very simple lambda times e to the negative lambda x for all non-negative x, okay? So it's a non-negative random variable and has an exponential distribution, got it? And the question is, uh, can you find every n-soda probability mass function? 
if they are the same as what we have derived already. Okay, these two definitions are equivalent. Okay. Any idea? Any idea of how to find the first order probability mass function given this inter arrival processes property? And it's all up to you, okay? So I will give it uh, to you as a homework problem, okay? And there are many other definitions. Definition three, four, and they are much complicated, okay? So definition one and two are not all the definitions. Actually, definitions three, four, five, six, these are more important actually, but uh, it's out of, this course is scope, that's what I believe, got it? So uh, we are almost done, okay. Yeah, they, they talk al almost the same thing, but anyway, let's move to the uh, moments, okay? So here, uh, I want to compute the expected value of N of T, that is the mean function. And I also want to compute the autocorrelation function or autocovariance function. By the way, anybody? Here we must have what? Mu sub n of t1 times mu sub n of t2. Okay. So let's tackle the first one. What is the mean path or mean function of the Poisson process. And not only I'm asking you to compute the mean path, I also want to ask you to compare this mean path with typical sample patterns and see the surprises. What do you guess? This is a Poisson random variable. And this random variable is parameterized by lambda t. So very simple. Done. What does this mean? I always ask you to visualize, right? Visualization and simplification is my message. It's, it, they are my lessons to you. Okay? If you live up to 100 years old and still remember or want to recall your graduate time, and probably you do not want to re remember me, but uh, I still want you to remember that the most important two keywords <laughs> during your graduate studies are what? Simplify and visualize, got it? So very simple. So your mean pass is simple linear function with slope lambda. It's very strange, right? Because every sample pass of a counting process is what? Is discontinuous. It's a piecewise constant <coughs> function. <laughs> However, its mean pass is a very smooth, right? Very smooth straight line. So what does that mean? From this example, we realize that mean pass sometimes is very, very misleading, right? Mean pass could be very, very misleading. We already know from our undergraduate study, right? The mean value of a random variable could be very misleading in many cases. In random processes, that, that warning is much more exaggerated and much more uh, worth to be emphasized. Okay, second one, correlation. Before we uh, compute this one, what about computing that one first? Or uh, how can we proceed? Okay, let, let's, let's just do this one, okay? Uh, is it? Okay, yeah. So how can we compute? the autocorrelation function. And what do we need? Okay, here, this is an expectation of the product of two random variables, 
Again, we may assume that T2 is greater than T1 without loss of generality. Okay, so let's assume T2 greater than T1. And then we want to do what? This value can be K1, or this value can be K2. And by using double summation, actually this is double summation with respect to K1 and K2, but since we assumed T2 is greater than T1, K2 must be greater than or equal to K1, right? <coughs> and then here goes two parameters and we must multiply what? N of T1 equals K1 and N of T2 equals K2. What is that? The second order probability mass function of the random process N of T. We've just calculated in the above, right? So we do the calculation and what do we obtain? And also we do the same thing here and this is, uh, okay, okay, let me, let me skip what was that. If I remember correctly, this is easy to remember. T2 minus T1 plus, uh, am I correct? I hope I'm correct. Uh, lambda T1 minus, minus, minus. Yeah, I do not remember exactly, but something like this. Uh, let me, let me just check just a second. Oh, okay. Yeah, I won't do that. Okay, this is too complicated. So, By definition, this autocorrelation function must be definition. Uh, by definition, must be computed using this formula. But here goes the trick. Okay, here goes three. We are going to use the first definition, independence of increment. Okay, because that is always easier. So here, uh, let me convert this one in this way. So what I do is that. Uh, we want to introduce non-overlapping intervals. So n of t2 minus n of t1 plus n of t1, got it? They are the same, right? And then what? This can be viewed as n of t1 minus n of zero. So this in the interval associated with this random variable is non-overlapping with this interval. What does that mean? They are independent random variables. So independence give us the expectation of the products can be written as a product of expectations. By the way, that is the implication of independence. The definition is uncorrelatedness, but anyway, and times, uh, uh, sorry, plus T1 squared, right? So we group like this. So we have this times that and this times that, got it? And now what is the expected value of N of T1? That is lambda times T1. So this is lambda t1, and what about this? Lambda t2 minus t1, right? As we've seen already here. And what about this? Uh, am I right? Yeah, lambda t squared, t1 squared, t1 squared. Yeah, so uh, what do we have? Lambda t1, lambda t1, Lambda T2 minus Lambda T1 squared plus Lambda T1 squared. So it seems we have Lambda square T1 and T2. Am I correct? Something looks not correct. Just a second. Oh, okay, okay. Here 
I made a mistake. So, yeah. Just a second. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is wrong. Here, this is uh, lambda t1 minus lambda t1 squared. Sorry, sorry, plus. Yep. So I, I told you the uh, Poisson random variable with parameter some alpha has mean alpha and variance alpha. Okay. So uh, its correlation is the Variance plus mean squared. That's what I remember. Yeah, I believe so. So now let's expand. So lambda t1, lambda t2, negative lambda t1 squared plus lambda t1 plus lambda t1 squared. So we have canceled and lambda t1 plus lambda square t1, t2. What is this, by the way? We assumed T1 is less than T2, so we can replace it like this if we do not restrict which one is bigger, okay? Got it? So obviously, this covariance function becomes what? Because this is lambda T1 and lambda T2. We cancel that one, lambda times minimum of T1 and T2, got it? So we got the mean function, autocorrelation function, and autocovariance function over Poisson random variable with rate lambda. By the way, that rate lambda with unit hertz is what? It turns out to be uh, the number of average number of arrivals per second. Okay? So that is called arrival rate. Anyway, so let's see the autocorrelation function. Is it a function of time difference, T2 minus T1? And your answer is no. Okay. This is not a constant. This is not a function of time difference. What does that mean? Definitely, Poisson random process is not wise and stationary. Means it's not stationary at all. Right? So you've seen a very interesting random process, very simple to describe, that is not stationary. Okay. And you can easily guess that the every counting process cannot be stationary because if you add up some number, how could it have a constant mean, right? So counting process seems far from far from a uh, stationary process. That is wrong, actually, because given a counting process, you can define another random process that is stationary, sometimes, not always. Given a counting process, you can find associated arrival process and inter-arrival process. Other than that, you can define some other random process, and it could be very, very stationary, got it? So be careful, okay? I'm not saying that accounting process, especially Poisson process, is very hard to handle. As you've seen here, definition is very simple, right? So we could be somehow be able to find lambda from the sample pass, observation of sample pass, and actually that is true, okay? So, uh, for example, in, a, in our stock market analysis, we may assume that the arrival of the transactions is Poisson. Then what does that mean? We just use a single parameter, lambda, arrival rate, to model that. So we only need to find or estimate the arrival rate. Very simple. No million parameters, just so single parameter which also implies that Poisson model may be too simplistic. So you must be careful when you handle or you model a phenomenon as a Poisson counting process. Okay, 
Anyway, so I believe we are now done with the, uh, yeah, we are done with the, yeah, as you see, uh, sorry about that, correlation is that one, okay? So covariance is just simply, well, that one, got it? And by the way, we can also compute the uh, mean power <laughs> using the first order moment, and that is very simple. You can just the set T1 equal T2 and get this result. Ready? Okay, so uh, we are now moving to complex valued random variables and processes. You can download this from the primary web page, which is sub page of my left home page. Okay, I'll cover this very quickly in 15 minutes. Okay, <laughs> so. Here is a complex valued random processes. That is the title of uh, section 6.7 of uh, Peebles textbook, but I augmented it a lot. Okay? So first, let's start from a complex, complex valued random variable. What is it? A random variable Z, actually, that consists of real part random variable and the imaginary part random variable. By the way, J times Y is an imaginary number. Y is the imaginary part of Z. Be careful, okay? And X and Y must be jointly distributed real random variables. Okay? So you must be given, or you must be able to find the, the joint PDF, PMF, C, uh, uh, CDF, characteristic function of an X and Y. And then you have fully described this complex random variable. <laughs> Of course, this is a kind of undergraduate version or a very simplified version. We have to define an underlying probability space and then two real random variables. And then you multiply the square root of negative one and then add to have this complex valued measurable function and by dropping uh, parenthesis S, we just denote this one as a complex random variable. Got it? And you see the similarity between a complex random variable with a vector valued random variable or a random vector. So as here, it is emphasized that a complex random variable is equivalent to a random vector of length two. And each element is the real and the imaginary parts. Got it? And now let me ask you a question. Then how can you define a CDF, cumulative distribution function of a complex random variable? And that actually tortured me when I was an undergraduate student. What is the CDF of a complex random variable Z? And your answer is, don't say this, okay? This is wrong answer, the wrong, wrong answer. What is wrong with this, this wrong approach? No inequality is possible when you have two complex something, right? So actually, you have to think about this one. You must go back to the real part and the imaginary part. So if you want to define some CDF, then it must be what? The CDF of two a joint CDF of two random variables, got it? So you must replace X with real part of Z and Y with the imaginary part of Z after you find the joint PDF, CDF of the real part and imaginary parts, got it? Because it does not make sense. What about the PDF? What about joint PDF? Same. 
the joint PDF, or sorry, the PDF of Z must be equal to the joint PDF of the real part and imaginary part. Got it? So you, you must write this way if the dense joint density of an X and Y exists. Be careful. The first argument, Z plus Z conjugate divided by two is what? The real part as you learned in high school and, uh, and Z minus Z conjugate divided by 2J is what? Image part of Z. So you have done, got it? And there are many uh, interesting complex random variables. And here is a set of all complex random variables. And here is a very small subset. But let me exaggerate again. And they are called circular complex random variables. And unfortunately, uh, people do not agree uh, on a single definition. Some people love this one. A complex random variable Z is circular or circular symmetry if, this is if for the definition, Z and its rotated version e to the j theta means you rotate z uh, by theta radian, has the, have the same distribution. What does that mean? They must be, rot they have rotational symmetrical distribution with respect to the origin, got it? So on this, circle with fixed radius, the density must be the same, okay? And of course, on this circle, the value of the density may be different from the value of that density evaluated at that point. However, some people love the circularity with respect to its mean. By the way, we haven't defined the mean of a complex random variable, but it's very simple to define. The mean of a complex random variable is because we want to keep the expectation operation as a linear operator. It's the mean of real part plus j times the mean of the imaginary part. So suppose here is the mean of z, and the PDF has contour that is that a contour that are concentric uh, circles, then what? According to this guy's definition, this random complex random variable Z is circular. However, this definition says it's not circular because it does not have symmetry with respect to the origin. So be careful. Some papers, some textbooks, some professors love this definition, but some do not, got it? By the way, I, I love this definition because circular, I, uh, to me, means circular with respect to the origin, symmetric. Anyway, by the way, uh, since we have defined the mean value of a complex random variable, now we want to define the second order moment of a, a complex random variable. How? Here goes the definition of variance. And this looks strange or not to many of you. So what about this? So we subtract the mean, okay? Mean is denoted by mu sub z. And then here, is it parentheses or not? Here we take the modulus or absolute value of this complex valued quantity. And then we square and compute the expectation. So this argument is a non-negative real value, right? Got it? If Z is real valued, then this definition of the variance of Z is consistent with our definition of the variance of a real random variable, no problem, right? So you may say that, okay, definition is well-defined. This definition is acceptable. Now, Let's see what does this mean. If we expand this one as 
x plus jy minus expectation of x plus j times expectation of y squared, what happens? What happens? We know that the modulus squared of a complex number is what? The modulus, the, the, the square of the real part and scale of the imaginary part, right? You know that. So let's take the real part and we have what? And this is what? Variance of x plus variance of y. When I first was given this definition of variance of the complex random variable, I noticed that something is seriously wrong. Why? Because given a complex random variable, which is equivalent to two jointly distributed real random variables, there is what, in general, non-zero covariance or correlation or something, right? But here, this variance does not have the cross term. Something strange, right? But the professor never said, because it was an undergraduate course, never said about this strange definition. And later, when I was, I became a graduate student, I realized that people have been defining another definition similar to variance. That is, some people call it pseudo variance. P is not pronounced pseudo variance, or some people love complementary variance. Complement means uh, in Korean. So we have variance and complementary variance. And definitely we expect that complementary variance have the information about the cross term. And let's see whether it really has. The definition differs in that it does not take the modulus of the difference. So this squared value is in general not real. So complementary variance or pseudo variance can be a complex number. Now let's rewrite it in terms of X and Y, the real and the imaginary parts. What happens? So we do almost the same thing, but now we change this to parenthesis and square. Then we have what? So. Right? So we have if, oh, sorry. <coughs> so we replace this modulus operation with just simple parenthesis. We have this squared and two times first term expected and this term squared and then we take expectation. So we have three or you may say four terms. And the first term is simply the variance of X, right? So we have variance of X, and then we have two J times covariance of NX and Y, am I right? And then be careful, we have minus variance of Y. Now let me ask you a question. Suppose I have given you two numbers. One real number, that is the variance, and another, the other, the other, the other one is complex number, that is complemented variance. I give you two numbers, and then I ask you to find the variance of x, variance of y, and covariance of x and y. Can you find it now? Yes, you can. How? See that? 
This is a real number, no imaginary part. This is, in general, has real part and imaginary part. So you take the real part of it, which is variance of x minus variance of y. And here you have the summation of that. What does that mean? You take the real part of it, and you add and divide by 2. You have the variance of x. You subtract divide by 2. You have the variance of y. And you take the imaginary part of it, divide by 2. You have the covariance. So the variance and co uh, the pseudo variance or complementary variance of a complex random variable provides you what? All the second order moments of two random variables, x and y. So we are happy now, right? And what does that mean? Variance alone does not provide you full description of the second order property of a complex random variable. This is very important. Okay. Many people, I believe 90% of professors just do not understand. Surprising, got it? Because they were not taught in this way. Anyway, let me move to another one. Yeah, this is done. done. And here goes, okay. <laughs> Here goes a very important definition. However, given the set of all complex random variables, there is a very small subset, but important one, called the set of all proper complex random variables. And how do we define the propriety over complex random variable. If complementary variance vanishes, which means zero, then we call the random, complex random variable is proper. Okay. So here, you have some random variable, then that has pseudo variance zero. What does that mean? Pseudo variance is zero. Let's go back to the definition of pseudo variance or simple consequence, okay? So pseudo variance has real part that is the difference between the variance of real part and the variance of imaginary part. When do we have zero given a complex number? Real part is zero and the imaginary part is zero. What does that mean? Variance of real part and variance of imaginary part must be the same. That is the first one. Second. Imaginary part must be zero. What does that mean? Real and imaginary parts are uncorrelated. So here, these proper complex random variables have very interesting property. Real part and imaginary parts are what? Having the same variance and they are uncorrelated. Got it? Now, We have a lemma. Every circularly symmetric complex random variable with finite variance is proper. And here I assume, uh, yeah, this this with or without mean zero, okay? Because anyway, in order to talk, to talk about propriety, we subtract the mean. So if the uh, circular symmetry definition allowed non-zero mean, anyway, that is gone. So why? because z and z to the e j theta has the same distribution. And what do we know? What, what do you want to do? Suppose z already has mean zero, then variance of z equals complementary variance. Right? This holds for all theta. If z is circular, this z squared has the same distribution as z times e to the j theta squared, right? 
And then this is a constant, so you take it out. And you choose theta as pi over 2. What does that mean? This is negative 1. Some number equals negative of its number. What does that mean? They are 0, right? So the complementary variance vanishes, which means that every circular complex random variable is proper. Got it? So you can say something like that. Got it? Circular means proper. Got it? The converse is not true in general. By the way, uh, let, let me uh, emphasize this one uh, because uh, I want to give you at least what is complex, proper complex Gaussian random variable. Now, here goes proper complex Gaussian random variable. It's complex, right? Complex Gaussian. And now it's proper. What does that mean? The real part and the imaginary part has what? Same variance and they are uncorrelated. And they are Gaussian jointed. What does that mean? They are independent, right? The real part and imaginary parts are independent. And after subtracting mean, right, they have same uh, second order moment. What does that mean? Suppose this mu is the mean of this uh, complex Gaussian random variable, then the real part <laughs> and the imaginary parts are IID after subtracting mu, right? And you know that the contours are what? Circles. So if we define the circularity after subtracting the mean, a proper complex Gaussian random variable is always circular. If you do not allow, uh, if you uh, do not allow non-zero mean, if mu is zero, and then proper complex Gaussian is always circular, right? So anyway, we got it. And another one is that let's find the density function. And I still remember when I first saw this density function, I thought the professor had a typo on his slide. It is not, okay? Suppose that the variance is sigma squared. By the way, the variance of a complex random variable equals what? The variance of real part and variance of imaginary part. Proper means that they are the same. What does that mean? This implies variance of x equals variance of y equals sigma square over two. And what about the density function of x? What about the density function of y if they have zero mean? One over square root sigma square over two e to the negative two times sigma square over two x square, and you have the same. If mean is zero, right? What does that mean? Here, you have the same thing, that is pi sigma square, and you have square root but two, so you have pi sigma, okay? Not typo, this is not typo. And also, you have here what? Sigma. It's not typo. Where is two? I said, actually. When I was a graduate student, I said, where is two? Two disappears, okay? And what? You have x squared plus y squared. That is z modulus squared. No, never use parentheses, okay? Modulus, of course, we need to subtract because here I assume the mu is zero, but in general, we have to have then zero mu, got it? So if you have a proper complex Gaussian random variable with mean mu and variance sigma square, then this is the density function, okay? Here, horizontal axis is the real part of Z and the vertical axis is the imaginary part of Z. And you have some center mu and circular contour lines, got it? Okay, that's all for today.